Johnny Lee Long, how are you doing? Shout out, Kaka, my brother. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> What's happening, indeed. Um, you know, I was telling you before we got started that, you know, I've been watching your your uh, uh, your channel. I mean, it's and it's been steadily growing. Mm -hmm. But I've been watching your videos for a long time. And uh, and it's not just me watching your videos. Uh, my son, who is eight years old, mm -hmm. he has literally grown up on on shot a caca guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love him already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's he, and he's quite lovable. Um, yeah. So, uh, so where did that come from? The the shot of caca thing. Man, you know, it was it was like um, I was doing a video one one evening in my studio, and it just blurted out. And I said it right after I burned. I was like, I have no idea what this means, but it sounded cool. So I just kept it. Yeah. But to me, it means never, always hello and never goodbye. That's what it, that's what it means to me. Always hello, you're, never goodbye. You're, you're, uh, one of the reasons I watch your video, I mean, I, I think your um, videos are very informational. And I am a kind of a gear junkie mm -hmm. and, and sometimes being able to see you play an instrument that I, that I really want, um, it causes me to at least, well, I'm seeing him play it. Okay. <laughs> That's going to have to, I can do it vicariously. You know, I, I don't have to sell more stuff. You know, um, <laughs> so sometimes that's, that's the thing. And I started doing some work on my own basses and guitars mm -hmm. and watching you do certain things and, um, uh, has, uh, you know, has been, you know, has been helpful in that journey, but I also watch your videos because, uh, you're always upbeat and, uh, you know, even when, there's been pretty dark stuff happening in the world, especially over the last year and a half. Yeah. You're still upbeat and you're still smiling and it's obvious that you enjoy tremendously what it is that you do. I do, man. I, um, I, I I'm truly, uh, I'm truly grateful for just being able to do what I do, man. I, I'm just an old country boy from Conway, North Carolina. And I'm going to tell you, we got one stoplight. Once you pass through that stoplight, you're the only way out of town. So, I, you know, for me, you know, everything is, it means something to me. Everything means something. And, and you should never, I mean, there are people that go down. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I go down, you know, you'll never tell because I try to keep myself hyped um, even when things are happening. But, you know, even through this pandemic and stuff, man, I try to keep people uplifted because, you know, when you start going down, you can't stop that roller coaster. It's still, it keeps going down, 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 and it gets faster. But if you can actually make them stop and, you know, give them something, give them some hope, that roller coaster will do a, a dive and a go back up again. And that's what I try to keep doing, man. Because when I say it to you guys, I'm actually helping myself. That's the way it happened. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what what got you uh, into um, you know working on on bases? Actually, man, um, I ain't had no money. I ain't had no money. I couldn't keep paying tax, man. And I kept going. I have I don't have enough money to to even get my own guitar working right, man. So I was like, look, I want to turn my own stuff all to pieces. And if it don't go back together right, I just keep doing it until it goes right. And that's what I did. And then. After a while, my queen was like, you know, you should do that for a living. I was like, uh, okay, you know, if you agree with it, I'm definitely for it. Because I was getting pretty good with it, with fixing my own stuff. There are some stuff, I, you know, I, I worked on my own. There's some very expensive stuff I, I was not happy with, you know. But it still came out right because I, I kept messing with it until it got right. So basically, 
make a long story short, I ain't had no money, man. I ain't had no money. I ain't, I ain't gonna lie, I ain't had no money to pay nobody to, to set up my base and pay nobody to fix it. So if it didn't work, I just had to keep playing it, find a way around it until I get it fixed. Yeah, that's that's uh that's definitely been a motivation for me to start working on my instruments is that um not just the money thing, but also just the idea of someone sitting on your instrument for a couple of weeks before oh, you get it back. That's another and, thing. Woo! You know, three yeah. weeks, four weeks, five weeks, you got a, you got a gig. You know, you're hoping that you can put it in that Monday and then that Friday be ready, at least by Friday. You go call, they ain't even started on it yet. And it's like, man, this is just frustrating, especially if you ain't got but one base. You know, you got one base, you got to, that base got to work for you because you got to make money. So my whole thing was to open my shop was if I get, if I get fast enough, I can get it in and get it out within a week. And sometimes less than that, you know, it depends on um, the parts that they're coming in and stuff. If I can get the parts right. that fast, that base is going out of here. I can't, my shop is not that big to keep all these great and wonderful instruments in there, man. So I try to get them in and get them out. And uh, so, so folks are are sending you their instruments. Oh, like absolutely! New instruments, absolutely. So I, yeah. So, so how did that how did that get started? Because that's that that seems like something. It, it doesn't seem like that's. It, it seems like you'd have to be very deliberate. That doesn't seem like something that would just organically just start happening. Well, it, I'm gonna tell you who started it though. I'm gonna tell you who gave me a hand and really getting this thing started. It was Tom Borney. Everybody know Tom Borney. Um, he is, he used to play for so many groups. I think he's doing some play in New York right now. Um, but he was with Stilly Dan. So Tom brought me his bases, man, because he his house got in a flood in New York. And so his bases, all, most of his bases got destroyed. He put a, he believed in me enough to bring me his one. Actually, it was like early, early for Daryl, early, early, no, early, early Ken Smith and early, early Perdula. And when they got there, man, it, it smelled like everything. It smelled like well pee, crab pee. It was all kind of, <laughs> it was all kind of <laughs> octopus. It was all kind of, it, when we opened that case up, man, oh my God, the stench was horrendous, man. But, I mean, if you look at my videos, you know, that bass turned out absolutely beautiful. That bass, I mean, but it was rotten. It was on the other side of rotten. And it, it you know, with, with, with the gifts that God had gave me, man, that thing, those basses turned out amazing. And after that, he just started bringing me everything. And, and then after that, other people saw, you know, sending me stuff and i was like man these people are sending me bases from all across the world i was like this is amazing i was blown away man i told who i was like yo I'm oh yeah yeah i was telling who i was like man i'm blown away man y'all don't know who that's all you, you get to know him yeah. <laughs> okay, well, well we'll tell but tell us about hootie and, and how did that kind of dude uh, hootie uh, he ain't in here hootie we went to the we went to a, um, a like a farmer's market, and he was sitting up there. We needed something to stop the squirrels from eating up my trash can. Right, I'm going to tell you exactly how it started. The squirrels I got around here are gangsters. They're just straight gangsters. They eat the top of the trash can off so they can get in there to the trash. So, I, you know, we decided, the queen and I decided to go to somewhere and get an owl. We figured we put an owl by the trash can, that it would stop the squirrels from coming in there and, you know, taking our trash and throw it all over the floor, all over the ground. It worked for like two days. I saw, I saw Hootie on top of the trash can when I came back. Man, he was on the other side of the fence. I was like, how he get way on it? The squirrels had actually drug him on the other side of the fence, man. They were... They were gay banging him, dude, on the other side of the fence. I was like, oh, this ain't going to work. I said, I might well just take you and put you back in the shop, man. And that's how it came to, to be. Somebody saw him standing behind me, and I was like, well, his name is Hootie. They was like, oh, what did he do? And I'm like, none. He just, he just, he just stands there, man. Thank you so much 
for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. Just stands there, man, and supervise. And from that point on, I had I had a truck a truckers, um, wives to call. I had a lot of women to call and ask about Hootie. I started doing all kinds of antics with him, man. Uh, like fishing and 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 flying. No, he can't fly. Flying and so like all kinds of stuff, man. That's how I got started. Yeah. So um so you were talking about folks sending you their their instruments. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of turnaround do you usually get for something that comes into your shop, like uh, something that gets mailed in? Normally, what I when I talk to folks, I said, you know, I, I give, I try to give them two to three weeks. That's that's my thing, two to three weeks. If it's nothing hard, like I got to do a, a lot of modifications, uh, a lot of routing and stuff like that, even painting, that takes longer. So. Right. My thing is once the once the guitar gets in and I really get my hands on take a look at it and I, I try to figure out within myself how to turn that around and get it back to them as soon as possible. Long as they don't keep calling and changing, um basically I can get it back to them at least by two, two and a half weeks. Sometime earlier, sometime within that week. It depends on how if the parts are in the shop. If they're not in the shop, I gotta order them. That takes a week and week and a half. And right now, since the pandemic, stuff are really slow. I mean, you should know that. I mean, you order something, it's like, maybe to come, maybe within that date, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you just had a birthday. It's did it. As now Cacolinians would say, I had a birthday, it's did it. <laughs> yeah. It's did it. Well, well, happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Happy birthday. And... Um, I saw that you had a, you were, I guess you're sort of marketing it as sort of a birthday sale and you had those, what it was at four or five bases yep. that you're, uh, that you're selling. Yep. Um, one of those bases, uh, I used to own. Let me uh, tell you, let me tell you what it is. Padula. No, nah, it wasn't. Oh, Padula. oh, I missed it. It wasn't a Padula. It was, uh, it was the terra firma, the BTB. Oh. Um, and, uh, of course I didn't have the, the, you souped it up. I might've kept it if, 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 you know, <laughs> if, if you had it souped up like that. But, uh, that's, that's actually one of the instruments that I regret sell, selling. Uh huh. Um, I've had a number of instruments uh, but that one and maybe two others where I like deeply regret selling them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure with all of the instruments that you see and all the bases that you have in your collection, there's gotta be some instruments that you're like, man, how did I let that one go? <sighs> yep. There are, there was a 74 jazz bass that I got from uh, uh, a brother that was playing in a church. He came out on a concert and he was playing at a church and I traded him. I think I had a, I had a 79 music man and I traded him for that jazz. And I, to this day, <clears throat> I regret getting rid of that jazz. That, that was the most amazing sounding jazz bass I ever heard and playing it. I, I never felt anything yet close to that. Uh, I don't even know where it is now. I, I have no idea. When I got from Europe, it was gone. So I, I, I don't know where it is now, but that's, that's one of the bases that I regret that I had to let go of. Other than that, that's about it. That's the only one I can think of right now. <laughs> oh, it was a Smith. Kid Smith. There was a Kid Smith I let go of. And I was like, what were you thinking? Oh, I was, it was a five-string BSR 5J. I have never seen and played one. In fact, I played that, that bass on Donald Richardson's workout. If you ever seen that video, 
where mm -hmm. Donald Richardson did a workout and uh, TV One had just opened up. And I, I was the first one on TV One. And that video is still circulating. But for one year, I, was, I played that bass on TV One every day, three times a day. Can't find it now, though. Yeah. I had a, um, uh, well, this is a guitar, but oh. it's a, 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 a Parker Nightfly. Um, and I had, uh, it had a single coil in the neck. And I took that out and put a, uh, put one of those, uh, those single, uh, single sized humbucker Stat. pickups that, uh, <clears throat> who, who makes those? That's, uh, I can't think of the, of the company. I mean, if, if was I said, Barton? You know, no, it was, um, Seymour Duncan. Seymour Duncan. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then that, in that particular guitar, it's it, it it's designed they, they those are designed with a floating bridge system right uh, which is really well in tune it's really light because they cut away some stuff out of the uh out of the headstock plus the the neck is made out of something else it, it's not it, there's something else in the in the neck that makes it lighter mm -hmm. um and it had a piezo bridge oh Oh, and the, and the way the output system was, is that it had a stereo, a stereo out. So you would, so you plug in like a, uh, like one of those insert cables in, mm -hmm. and then each side would give you, would give you, so you'd have just the piezo or just the, the magnetics, uh. or if you just put a standard cable in, both of them will come out of the same cable. And uh, yeah, that's one of those things I, I, I regret selling. And then oftentimes what happens is you don't even remember what you got in exchange. Like, I don't that's even remember. That's the sad like... part. <laughs> I'm sitting there going like, okay, I know I gave some, I don't even know what I, what I did with that base. Actually. I, I know I, I traded it or I think I traded it for something and what I traded it for wasn't even close to what that base was. I was so mad, man. I thought I did it. You know how you feel something the next morning? Go like, I think I made a boo-boo. Serious boo-boo, man. <laughs> I can't get the base back. It's gone. Yeah. Oh. The, the one other, one other, uh, one other instrument I regret selling is, was a, um, I had this, uh, it was like an eighth size acoustic bass. It had a real neck on it. Um, and it was a, it was the, the neck was detachable, uh, detachable. You could disconnect it from the, so that you could get it in a bag. So if you needed to get on a plane or something, mm -hmm. but it was a real acoustic bass and it had a really nice realist pickup in it. And I had a guitar tech from, in town here named Craig Phillips, who is totally killing. Um, I had him do some work on it. Um, and so the action was really low and everything. The reason I sold it is because I was think I was saying to myself, you know, all right, I'm learning how to play acoustic bass. I've got this instrument. Okay. Let me go ahead and do it. So I learned all of my major scales, two octaves and all the right, you know, position and, and everything. And then I was like, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> so then I sold it and I, tra and I, I, but I didn't really sell it. I traded it and I got like an amp and a, and a cabinet, which I still use all the time. Okay. But it was not a, it, that wasn't a good, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Cause now I wish <laughs> I had that. that, that <laughs> I wish I had that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah so anyhow okay so so can you talk to us about um your upbringing oh man and, uh, what got you okay. into music that's a good that's a good question man all right so basically i was born in conway north carolina that is a cotton field kind of place so um 
from the time I was born to, man, from the time I left, I was picking cotton. And people would look at me and go like, you pick cotton? I was like, yeah, man, because during the summertime, you know, there was no going to camp. It was going to the cotton fields and peanut fields and, and corn fields. That's what, you, that's what my time was. But what happened was my mom, um, well, before that, all I could hear was Glenn Campbell, Dolly Parton, and Hee Haw. That's all we heard. And on Sundays, we had a black radio station for them. One to three. That's that was it. But during the week, all I heard was Glenn Campbell, Dolly Parton, and He Hard. That's the only music I, I knew, you know, and I heard. So my aunt went out and bought a record player. And when she bought a record player, I started hearing Al Green and, and Sam Cook and stuff like that. And then my mom bought me a, a plastic guitar for Susan Robot. And I have no idea what to do with it. But as time went on, I became more interested in playing, man. And, I, and what happened is I got in high school and we was at this uh, talent show and um, we was get ready, to, get ready to gear up for the talent show. And the bass player, Dan, his name was, you know, his name was, his name is, you know, uh, Mike. Um, and I told Mike, I said, hey, man, his name is Mike Buck Butler. I said, hey, man, I said, how do you remember all those songs? He was like, I don't know. Yeah, you know, we was in high school. So, you know, I was on Congos then. I started out on drums. I didn't start out on bass. And so uh, I said, man, I'll tell you, what you, what you learn me, teach me how to, I said, learn. I said, did I say learn? I said, learn. I said, what you, I did say learn, did I? I said, why don't you teach me how to play that thing, man? He was like, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to work, man. I'm not going to do that. I was like, okay. And then I guess he thought about it, and I don't know if he did. But he's like, uh, I'll tell you what, man, we're ready to get out for the summer. If you learn how to play a couple songs on a bass, I'll bring you a brand new bass when school comes back in. Now, here's the catch. My fraternity brother, that was my best friend then before we got to college, um, his dad had a garage, a dirt garage in his backyard. And in that backyard, he had all this, it was filled up to the brim. He's like, I need to get that garage cleaned up. And I said, well, you know, he said, uh, I heard you trying to learn guitar. And I was like, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what. If you clean that garage out, I got a good bass guitar somewhere in there. I don't know where it is, but if you find it, it's yours. Man, we, it took us a whole day to clean that garage out, a whole day. At the very end, at the very back in the corner, laying on the ground, was the bass that we found. I found the bass. It had no strings on it. I didn't know if it worked. I mean, it had so much dirt on it. You know, we had to actually sweep the dirt off it. And so I took it up and picked it up. I ain't had no amp, nothing. So uh, we kept on cleaning the garage and found a, a, a E string. I had no idea if it was an E, A, D, or G. All I know is very big. And so I took it and put it on the base and took the base home. And in my house, we had an RCA, Victor, floor model. That thing from wall to wall. And it, it, I never knew that it had guitar, headphones, and something else on the thing. And I was like, wow. So I took and went to Sears and Robux, no, Radio Shack, and got me a cord, stuck it in it, and it came on. And I was like, oh my God. So my my best friend played guitar then. So he told me, he showed me how to tune it one string of that E. And I learned, because it was my favorite group, Grand Sister Station. I learned Grand Sister Station I, I, I just stayed on that album. I went back to his other album. I tried to stay within Graham, Larry Graham. That's where I tried to stay. I learned every song on one string. Every song on one string. Then my, my boy told me, hey, man, I found another string. I'm going to bring it by. And he brought it by. It was an A. I was like, okay. So then I had to transpose everything I knew on that one string, put it on two strings. And so I learned everything on the whole whole album on two strings. And then my mom felt sorry for my guess and went out and bought me a whole set of guitar strings. I put them on. At that point in time, it was another brother that knew that I was trying to learn how to play. His name was Punkin. And he was playing for the number one uh, R&B band, cover band in Tidewater. Actually, in Virginia. It was called Pocket Edition. And it was, it was a uh, they, they was amazing, man. I, I never heard anything like them. 
they was playing down in Virginia Beach at the Peppermint Beach Club. And he said, look, man, my wife is pregnant. I need a, somebody to fill in for me. Come down to the Peppermint Beach Club. You can't come through the front door because you're too young. I'm going to sneak you in the back. So he snuck me in the back door, and I was hiding behind the amp because, you know, during that time, they had giant amps like S S SVTs and stuff like that and, and, and uh, acoustic. So I was standing behind the amp, and he said, I'm going to give you three songs to learn first. Turn Your Love Around, For Your Eyes Only, and one more other song. And he said, if you learn these, I'm going to let you play these next week. I need you to come back next week and play. I ain't had no bass. I mean, I had a bass, so I didn't have his kind of bass. Cause he had a, like a, seven, a 69 Jazz, 68 Fender Jazz, man. It was like, it, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. It was huge, but it was nice. So I went home, I learned all the songs. He said, now look, I'm going to leave early from the gig. I want you to sit right here behind the drummer and when they count it off, you play those three songs. And then after that, y'all go home. Leave my bass with the keyboard player. So, okay. I played them. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to give you five more songs. And he he kept doing it until I almost learned this whole show. But to me, I was just wanted to learn the songs. I didn't, I didn't know I was playing for anybody important. You know, to, to me, these guys treated me like, you know, I was one of them. So I just kept playing, kept playing. And then... His wife eventually his wife had a baby, and then I I didn't have to play anymore. So when we get back to school, uh, <laughs> my friend was like, "Hey man, so uh, did you learn how to play?" I was like, "I you know I, I got I got a couple songs under my belt." He said, "Yeah." He said, "Listen man, I'm gonna tell you exactly what he said." He said, "Listen man, um, I kept hearing about this uh, this black kid is is playing down at the Peppermint Beach Club." He said, "You heard anything about that?" He said, "He's pretty nice." I was like, "Nah." You know, because in my mind, I'm thinking, who is he talking about? And I was like, I said, well, you know, I said, man, I, I went down there a couple times in Virginia Beach and played a couple songs. He's like, was that you? And I was like, uh, okay, yeah, it was me, man. I was playing with the, with the, um, with the pocket edition. He's like, oh, he said, I'll be here tomorrow. He said it just like that. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. And early in the morning, I heard this. I go to the door. He had a 1973 P bass, spanking mm. brand new, sunburst, and that's how I started. Oh man, that's how I started, man. That's what's up. Yeah, that's what's up. And he's still my so, best friend today. He sure <laughs> is. So, 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 so after that. I mean, continue the story. All right. So, so, after after, that, so after that, I got into, I got into, I, actually, I got into a quartet group. It was an all girls quartet group called the Gospel Sensations out of Portsmouth, mm -hmm. Virginia. And I started playing with them, but actually, I was playing a fretless bass because I didn't want, I, I, I didn't want to play no frets no more. I wanted to see if I could hear what I need to play. So I got this Washburn, no, Wash Tone fretless bass. And I put an extra pickup in it, and I played that for about a year, you know, I, and never thought that I'm learning and training my ear at the same time. I never even thought of that. So I just wanted to play it. So then after about a year, I put it down, and I picked up a Fender Jazz. And once I picked that Fender Jazz up, man, it was a whole new different ball game. But my whole heart was to get a Music Man Stingray. And that was this, 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 the store down there, Alpha Music, and something happened and their store burned down or something, caught on fire. And they had stingrays all over the parking lot, burnt all over the parking lot. I still didn't have the money to go get one. And I kept saying, Lord, if you just give me the opportunity, Lord, if you give me the opportunity, I'm going to get me a stingray. So I left Portsmouth, moved to Richmond. And once I got to Richmond, I got in contact with this group called the Gospel Music Workshop of America and one of their offsprings. And I was playing for the Richmond chapter. And they went on tour to New York. It was New York, Philly, Delaware, and a couple other places. And when we got to New York, we were leaving. We was getting on the bus, leaving. And there were three other tour buses on the other side of the hotel. And I was sitting on the bus. And we was, he was getting ready to pull off. 
At that time, I had a PVT 40, candy apple red. Never seen another one like it in that time. It was absolutely beautiful. And um, I was sitting on the bus, and the Lord spoke to me. He's like, man, you need to go over there across the street because so there's something over there across the street that you need. And I was like, right. You know, we're ready to leave. He's like, no, you need to get off the bus, go across the street. There's something over there that I want to give you. I got off the bus. Everybody was like, yo, where you going? We're ready to leave. I got off the bus, walked across the street, and there was a, 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 a band over there, and they were um, Puerto Rican brothers, and their English was horrible, or I did, just didn't know the language. Their English English was okay. I just didn't know the language. Um, and so they, they was talking, and I said, look, hey, hey, all I need is your bass player. Where's your bass player? And one of them said, boss? And I said, yeah. And he's over there. And I walked over to the bass player, and I said, hey, man, what kind of bass you got? And no, first I asked him, do you speak English? He's like, very little. And I said, what kind of bass you got? He goes, I don't know, piece of crap like that. You know, he's like, piece of crap. I got it from the pawn shop. It no work. It no work. And I said, well, let me see it. It was sitting on the grass of the Hilton Hotel, sitting on the grass. And he says, it's over there on the grass. I walked over there. I saw the case. I said, it's got to be a fender or something, man, because it's a fender case. I opened up the case. And it was a white 77 music man. I slammed the case down, locked it, walked to the guy, said, Hey man, um, you said it don't work? He goes, No, no, it's a piece of crap. And I said, Okay, well then I got something on the bus that you might like. And he goes, and like five or six, I'm just sort of walking behind me, man. So, you know, I'm in a gospel group, so they're thinking, oh my God, they're gonna hurt him. They go, I was like, yeah, whatever. So I got to the bus. I told the driver, I said, could you get my guitar out the bottom of the bus? He said, we can ready to leave, man. I said, look, I'm telling you, you got to get the guitar out the bottom of the bus. And so he came off the bus, opened the door. I pulled the PV case out, which is the teardrop. And I sat it on the ground and I opened it up. And I could see behind me that the eyes was lighting up, man, because that's candy out of red. And I said, I'll trade you this for what you got on the ground. And they was like, they started speaking their language behind me and I didn't know what they were saying. So um, one guy said, no, 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 we don't do it. So I closed the case down, popped the case, picked the case up and I was gonna sh shove the case back in the, in the bus when my somebody caught my arm and I was like, and he goes, okay, we do, we do it. I socked the guitar down, walked away from him, walked over there to the, to the uh, Hilton Hotel on the grass, picked that bass up, walked back over to the bus, threw it in the bus, slammed the door down, got on the bus, and never seen these guys again. When I got to Delaware, the whole the whole bus was like, you gave that beautiful bass up, and you don't know that bass works or not. I said, I told him, just like that, I said, God told me to go over there. He had some over there for me, and that's what I did. And when I got to Delaware, I went inside the church, and I, I, I set my rig up, and once I set the rig up, I plugged it in, and I could hear something, but it wasn't enough. And they went off. The choir went off. I can't believe you ain't got no bass now. You got you trade that beautiful bass for this bass. And I kept thinking, why I keep hearing noise, but not a lot of noise? So I flipped the bass over, and there was a compartment on the back. Uh... Ah! <laughs> so... I had a I had one of those phase shifters with me. So I took the phase, the battery out of the phase shifter, and I opened up that compartment and I took the battery, normally what you don't do, and did this. And it was dead as a door now. I was like, I took that battery out of the phase shifter, slammed it in there. When I hit that first note, let me tell you something, man. I never played like that in my life. And, and I mean, all the choir members were saying the same. They were saying the same thing. It was like, man, it, it must be that bass because you up here killing today. I was like, man, I, it, it was like a it was like a whole world opened up to me, man, because I finally got my music, man. That was that was my heart. That's what I kept praying for, man. But that music, man, I was like, man, there's something about this bass. It's right, man. It's right. Once I started playing that, that was it. That was it. And like, like craziness, I traded off.
<laughs> that was it. I traded it, man. I was like, man, this is so crazy. All these many years I tried to get it, and then I traded it off. But I ended up getting another one, so I'm good now. I'm good now. So, so, so um, why did you have to have the music, man? Like, w- w- was there a particular artist that yes. you were like? Yes. Was Rick it James. Lewis Johnson or Rick nope. James? Okay. First, it was Rick James. Rick James was the first one I saw in my eyes with the music man. Then I saw Lewis. I saw Brothers Johnson. I went and got their album, Blam. I went and got Blam, uh, Street Wave. I went, I went and got all his stuff, man, because I kept hearing it, but... Lewis wasn't playing that music man on every album. He was playing a P bass, an Olympic. He was playing a a, a a Gibson. I was like, man, he's playing. But you can always understand that music man. I don't care what he had in his hand, whatever that when it, when he was playing that music man, I can always hear it. But Rick James got me got me locked into that music man. Rick James, and there was another group called uh, Mass Production. I saw that, and they were from Virginia. And the cat had a music man. I was like, that's the sound right there, man. That's the sound. So I went and got it. I went and got so, it. So uh so there's no, you know, it, it, it's not a secret. You're 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 a Christian. Yes, sir. Absolutely. No secret. Um uh, yeah, it's not a secret. Uh, no, sir. And you're uh uh, you you definitely have a particular worldview that seems to uh, dictate and control all the all that you do. Yes, sir. Is that something that developed early, or is that something that um, you know, or yeah. is that something that's somewhat late breaking? Well, my grandma Maybell, and I, I said her name because um, there's a there's a a song on my new CD called Maybell's Bean Soup. My grandma Maybell, um, she couldn't, she couldn't read or write. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, she could write her name. So um, she made us go to church every Sunday, even when we, sorry, even when we didn't want to go, man. And um, until this day, I I really appreciate what she did, man. Because during that time, it was like, why we got always got to keep going to church? And during that time, man, you know, we only had the piano player that played one. She played in one key for everything. I don't care what it was, one key. If it had the song was written in F, she played it other than one key C. And she wouldn't, and you couldn't make her move, man. She was like, dun, 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 dun. but you look at it go like. That song came positive. Every song came positive in that one key. But that's all she could play in. But she was good in that key. Uh, but my grandma Mabel made us go to church every Sunday. Um, and it was boring, man. It, it was boring. But what really got me, you know, into um, loving Christ to where I love him now is that I used to see my grandmother um, do things that I'd be like, man... What in the world? Like she would get out every day. She was get on her knees and pray, but she would sing. And I'm like, what is she singing and moaning about? But it all, it took me to almost I got, you know, college that I really realized that she was covering me, man. And my brother, she was in my and my little cousin. She was covering us, man. And um, when I really got the, the just of what she was doing. You know, I, I had to I had to stay with that man because she taught me a lot just humming and singing certain church songs and even in her prayers it was all about the humming and the singing and uh, you know she would go like mm, Lord uh, give me the strength you know that kind of stuff like I was like man and I always I always ask my brother like why mom always got the hum why she got the hum almost and like the spirituals sing? like the spirituals. Bruh. She didn't. She couldn't read or write, so she had to do what she, you know, what was n- naturally to her, and that's hum and sing at the same time and pray while she's doing all of that. And I was like, man, that is amazing. That's amazing to me. But she was my covering, man. She was straight my covering, and and you know what I saw God do for her was amazing. Somebody who couldn't read and write, um, just barely can write her name. Uh, she raised all her grandkids. 
you know, and children. I think she had, we had nine, she had nine. And then she raised her grandkids too, including me. Um, and you gotta, you gotta also remember, man, I, you know, well, you don't know, but you know, I was a straight A student, man, until I got to the 10th grade, you know, I dropped from A to B, but I was a straight A student. And it wasn't because my grandma was, you know, doing help me with my homework. She couldn't read or write, you know, but she would always inspire us to do better. You know, she couldn't, and we already knew that she couldn't read and write, but it didn't bother us at that time. But she was an inspiration, man, to, to do better. She kept, she kept saying, there's better things than here. There's better things than here, but you got to go out and get them. And I was like, what does that mean, man? What does that mean? You know, we in North Carolina. What's better than North Carolina? I ain't never been out of North Carolina. What's better than North Carolina? I, you know, I walked down the road and I ain't got no car and, you know, I'm going to cornfield, eat watermelon, you know, go. I, what's better than North Carolina? And then she said, you got to do better than this, better than me, be better than me. And when she said that, man, I was like, it didn't hit me until I got, you know, to high school and then got into college. It's like, I see what she's saying. You know, I, I, I got to give God all his grace and all, all the, uh, you know, all the glory, man. Cause it, it won't for him. I would be standing, won't for him. I would be standing talking to you right now or your son, <laughs> your son will be saying, shot at caca. <laughs> That's well, right. for God, right now, man, and well, for God, I would not have my queen, man. I'm telling you, it's it's what he's done for me so far is mind blowing. I couldn't even tell you half the stuff he's done for me, man. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to get people saved, but if that's what happens, that's what happens. I'm gonna tell you right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I I'm gonna tell you right now, man. That's my joy right there, man. Every morning, every morning I wake up, I'm like, man. I got first thing I do is pray for my subscribers. That's a, and we're talking four four thirty in the morning. You know, I'm on my knees praying for my subscribers, man. Cause that's people hurting, man. I'm praying for my family. You know, that's people hurting, man. They're hurting. They're hurting. This pandemic is killing folks, and they're and there's there is killing folks without killing them. If that make any sense, people are dying and people are losing their loved ones, so they're dying on the inside. So it's killing folks without killing them. Man, you know, people need to be uplift, man. They need it. They need it bad, man. They need it, bro. We, we, we're hurting right now. You know, we're hurting yeah, not only... Thing, we're yeah, not only hurting... Been, yeah, go ahead. It's been particular. Yeah, it's been particularly difficult for musicians. Oh, my God. Because you know, how how can you play a gig if you, if you can't have people in the room? But it opened a lot of musicians' eyes. Now, let's talk about yeah, that. That's true. That's true. All right. So, Cass was on the road. Now, I was on the road for a while. Cass was on the road who didn't use their, didn't use their common sense and store their money correctly or not hurting. And they're now coming to reality. It's like, wait a minute. I'm not on the road. I ain't got no money coming in. I have to get a nine to five. How am I going to get a nine to five when there's nothing open? So now we have, we into this dilemma of, dude, we in trouble. I can't pay my rent. I can't pay my car note. Uh, I got to sell my guitars. I got to sell my amps. And I'm thinking, man, this is an eye opener. This is an eye opener. And I kept telling Cassie, like, bro, if you out there on that road, you need to have insurance. You need to start banking your money. Uh, you need to start looking at, you know, your, your future. You need to stop looking at that one at this ple ple pleasant time. Present time, I'm like, I'm in glory right now. It's like, no, man, this stuff can stop tomorrow. And that's what happened. When that pandemic hit, people didn't realize it was going to shut it down like that. And a lot of musicians got hurt. You know, and I kept saying, guys, you know, we need to start praying for these cats, man, because so a lot of them wanted to take their lives. I mean, I was getting phone calls, man. I was like, bro, you know. Uh, I, I watched your video last night, man. You know, you saved me from, you know, I'm like, what? Okay. You know, I, I was about to go such and such. And I'm like, we don't need to go there, bro. You know, tell me what you need, man. See if we can help. If I got it, it's yours. You know, um, this, uh, <laughs> yeah, 
you know, the, everyone says the same thing, unprecedented and, and all of this. And uh, there was a lot of talk initially about, the, you know, there was this, this idea, this, uh, uh, what is it, essential workers. And, and I kind of took issue with that because I happen to believe that what musicians do, what it is that we do is essential. Mm -hmm. And I still, to this day, have not satisfactorily heard things from the media that even come close to describing the plight of musicians and also the plight of other service uh, folks in, that work in service industries. Um, there's not been very much time given to that. Um, and that's a, you know, that's, that's tough. Mm. That's tough. You know, um, you know, I've been blessed and fortunate to be in a situation where uh, this pandemic didn't break me, didn't break the, my family, um, didn't create, you know, incredible hardship. And, you know, I tried to find a way to, you know, create something positive, though everything is, you know, everything's falling apart, yeah. but you still try to do something positive. And I'll tell you, these conversations I've been having with folks through this whole thing, uh, you know, that's been a large part of my sanity. Mm. It's been a large part of my sanity. I'm yeah. a Christian also. Amen. And Hallelujah. I played in, yeah. And I played in church for, you know, mo most of my life. I grew up in church, all of mm -hmm. that. And that worldview, like, uh, Christianity, that worldview is, um, it's not just a personal thing, but it seems to be the one that most closely corresponds with reality. It gives the sort of explanation that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it's been something that I've, I've, uh, I've held on to, um, so you play, you play in church. I, I see videos of yep. you playing in church. Yep. And uh, that's always, it's always cool. Cause you always have, you know, I don't know if I've seen you play the, the same bass twice. <laughs> in church, you, know. you, you always got, <laughs> you always had the new joint. <laughs> yeah. Look, I saw but they, you but they ain't always one. mine, though. Oh, uh, right, right. Well, I saw you with this one, Ken Smith. Okay. That had this unbelievable finish on it. So I'd never seen anything like it. I, it. It must have been within the last month that I saw you play that. Maybe, what color was it? Maybe, maybe two months. I mean, it was kind of a natural color, but it, but it, it had some sort of uh, bluish haze in it. Uh, something. It, yeah. It had... Yeah, I, I got that Smith man, and um, it was beat the snot. Can I say snot? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was beat the snot, man. And um, and I said, you know what? I'm gonna take it apart. I'm gonna I'm gonna sand it down. I'm gonna sand all the group. It's the person who had it was digging into it, so he was a slapper. So his fingers were digging into the wood. So I had to sand it down to get rid of that digging part without putting putty in it. So I had to keep sanding it down, sanding it down until it smoothed out. So I kept thinking, well, since I got to sand it this much, I might as well put a, you know, put a, a clear coat over it. But I said, I want something different. So what I did was put a, a blue haze, a silver haze. Well, it actually is a blue pearl, a silver pearl, and then another blue pearl on top of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's when the you, base. That's when the you one. flip, when you turn, it flips. <laughs> but it looks like it looks like it looks like it's wet. That's how many coats I put on it. No, it was. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, all of the all of those instruments are beautiful. But that thank one you, man. Particular, yeah, that one in particular caught, caught my eye. Yeah, that's she's old, man. She's like eighty nine. 88, 89. PT custom. So I, uh, I remember seeing some, uh, videos and this, this was, uh, this was before the pandemic, I think. Mm -hmm. And you made a few videos and you were talking about how you just wanted to play, you know, sometimes you just want to play. Right. And then, and then after that, I, I started seeing, um, I mean, it's, I started seeing maybe some footage of you playing in some bands showing up at like, uh, Sam Ash and playing yep. like at jams and stuff like that. Um, can, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I, I wanted people to get out and you can't make people get out, but if they see you going out and seeing what you're doing, what I was doing is actually, um, uh, honing in on my craft. All right. I wanted to I wanted to hone in on how to groove without a drummer, um, how to groove and sing at the same time and what bass I should be having in my hand while I'm doing all this. So I took out all kinds of bases, man. I was just taking people bases out of everything. Um, but I kept telling people, you got to go to these open mics, you know, go to the open mic. Because that's your avenue of, of honing in where you need to be. Um, I would go, and a lot of times I wouldn't even play. I would sit there and watch folks. And I would say to myself, I don't want to do that. I like that, though. Um, I, need to, I need to hone in more on my talking and presenting myself to the audience. I need to do that. He's good at that. Um, mm -hmm. Or she's really good at that. Or, man, that dude is horrible. You know, he's just over talking, he ain't played yet. He just started, he just ran in his mouth. And then when you saw a play, it's like, oh my God, he's just completely horrible. But even when I say completely horrible, I'm learning stuff for him. Because as he's doing something crazy, I'm like, I ain't gonna do that. Uh, I like that though. So I'll take that and I'll take it back home and I'll it, infiltrate it in my stuff. And when you see it again, when he hear it again, he'll be like, man, that's a nice lick. Yeah, that was your lick. I took it home and refined it. And put it in my own style <laughs> and brought it back to you to let you hear how it should sound, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy. But that's what I do. I mean, you know, so I kept, I stayed at the open mics and the open mics were good for me, man. Sam Ash in Richmond, Virginia was really good. Sarah Massey Green was really good to me, man, because, um, she opened the door for a whole lot of musicians to come in and hone in on that crap on that crap. And I was like, I would sit there, man, and go like, man, it's some people coming out of the closet. I'm like, where you been? Oh, I just do it at home. I'm like, you should be in front of the television as good as you are. You know, but there's people that would not come out, you know, and and play in front of folks, but they will play at home and be amazing. And when they do come out, you go like, man, you're really good. Thank you. And then they go right back home. <laughs> you will never see them again. I'm like, wow. And then a lot of them I would, I would take and um, ask them to come back and make them play on stage with me, you know, just so they can be play with a real band. You know, whether the guys, some of the guys may not be up to par, but they feel good because they're playing in front of somebody, man. And I'm like, that's it right there, man. That's it. And then you, it's your time to teach. He's like, you know, hey, man, you know, when this is happening, don't do that. You know, you tell this drummer, hey, man, it's enough, not too much. You know, or you tell a keyboard player, you got to come up a little bit, man, with that. You know, don't do not do so much of this and let him play. And, you know, let me show you how to do, when somebody's doing a solo, how you lay down and let them do their solo. Don't solo on top of them. There's a nine people soloing. Nobody hear anything. You know, it was, it was a time to learn and teach. And, man, I love open mics. But then, you know, the pandemic hit and everything stopped. Everything just... Yeah. You know, flat out and left, man. So, but I didn't never stop gigging. Yeah, you know the uh, 
what you're describing as an open mic, others might describe as a jam session. And jam sessions have been like a, a really important part. I mean, we're talking about jazz and the mm -hmm. development of community. Mm -hmm. um, and also sort of to get connected in a scene. It's like, okay, well, I just moved to New York or something. Where are the jam sessions? Like, right. Let me get out right. to the jam session so I can meet other musicians. Yep. And uh, so that's like an, an important part of uh, what it is. You know, I encourage my students uh, all the time. I mean, look, you got to get out, you know, you, you got to go play. It's not just about spending a bunch of time in the practice room. That's important. And yeah, spend that time in the practice room probably before you go <laughs> to the session. Right. But even if you go to the session, like you were saying before, you don't have to play. You can just be there checking it out. Uh, you can be a participant without being on the stage. Right. And so, so anyhow, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, those, those sorts of uh, opportunities are, are important. And, and there are things that um, uh, as things continue to open up more and more, uh, one of the jam sessions that's here in Columbus, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the sessions that's here uh, that had been here for like 11, 12, 13, oh, long, several years on Tuesday mm -hmm. nights, uh, a couple months ago, just reopened and that was a big deal. And it's, and they've been doing really well there too. So it's been packed in there and, and, um, yeah, it's just good to see folks. <laughs> it's just good to see folks like out checking out music and, and yeah. You know, I, I, there's a couple of things about jam sessions that actually it to me is painful. Um, when I went to a jam session one time and it wasn't a learning experience, there was nothing I could get out of that because it was this was way before the pandemic, it was too many superstars. And so when you got a lot of superstars, you got people that's in there want to learn, but they can't learn because it's too many superstars. And when I say superstars, mm -hmm. I mean, cats in there that, um, you know, know they can play and, you know, they, their, their arrogancy takes over their gifts. And when you see that, mm. when you see that as a as a player yourself, you still I I, I get pained uh, because I know there's the little kid over there in the corner, and there's a little girl on that corner, and then there, there's a, a, a older guy back behind me. They really want to play, but they can't seem to get past how arrogant the people are on stage, even when they walk off stage. They they bringing that right down to the you know off stage. I'm like, bro, y'all killing a lot of folks in here, and you're a great player, but your attitude mm. is so smoked that you 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 you're hurting this young lady right here, and this young man right here, and even the older brother in the back. You're hurting them because they can't approach you because you in star form right there. And I'm like, what? You're still in this city. You can't be too much of a star, <laughs> man. Break that down, bro, so people can approach you and learn something. I had kids tell, tell me that, you know, they were calling people names. I, I tried to take, you know, lesson from this guy, and, you know, I, I couldn't because he was so, you know, he, he knew all this stuff, but he couldn't he couldn't project it to me correctly. And I'm like, you know, first of all, you got you to gotta lower yourself down. You got to bring yourself down to where people can approach you and learn. Even me, I'm learning every day, man. But when I walk across a cat that, you know, I can't approach correctly, and I don't know what correctly means, but if I can't approach him to even ask him something, um, that's painful for me, man, because if he's hurting me, you can imagine what he's doing to other folks that is not even to our level where we are right now, you know, that really wants to learn. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ego. Oh my God. Yeah. Painful, man. It hurts ego. my heart. I mean, you know, the, it, it, now, now granted ego takes a, takes a, you know, takes a lot of, uh, takes a lot of body blows, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the term ego. Cause you know, not, 
everything about ego is bad. Some, some things about ego um, can be positive, like egos involved in trying to improve. Okay. Like, you know, but the problem is that when, when it gets out of balance, that's, that's, that's where the problem is. And unfortunately, uh, musicians, folks, folks that are on the stage and are getting, getting this, yeah. um, I mean, we have, we have an issue these days. Also, we have an issue with people getting sort of validation by likes and you know <laughs> on social media and so they have convinced themselves that they are uh, important because they achieved a certain number of you know views or likes uh. or any of that kind of stuff <laughs> and it's the same thing it's still it's 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 expressed differently the you know the uh the method is different <laughs> but it's still the same thing and humans, you know, have a tendency to be that way. Yeah, I don't like I don't like sessions where I feel like folks are 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 like that. This particular session um, is is good because there's a good mix of professionals and and college students, and there's even some high school students that are in there, and and it's really kind of a community kind of thing. Okay. And um, and uh. uh but yeah, I've also been to the ones where it wasn't really the right thing. And or uh, the ones where you have folks that really don't have any business getting on stage. <laughs> and, then they, and then they try to take 30 courses. Oh, no. On something, you know. So you get, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, know, you I, don't know I, what you're going to get. <laughs> I, I, I tell people a lot, man. It's like, whatever you, the, the worst thing you can do, and I, I, I try to tell my, tell my church brothers and sisters that, if you're in your church and all the people in your church are telling you how wonderful you are, you need to step out of that. Because reality check is when you step out of that spot that everybody gave you glorification and you go to oh, another no. spot that, oh, that no. they don't know you, that's when reality hits in. It's like, baby, no. whatever you will need to do, the people in your church are gonna always love you. But no. and you may come out and say, Well, people in my church tell me I can sing. Now it's time to get a reality check. Step out of your church, step to yeah. another place where there's That's some bad. real people. That's when reality when reality checks in. You're like, uh, uh, you start hearing stuff correct. And you're like, no, we don't sing it like that at all. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. this one of those moments. <laughs> something, something that I say uh, uh, frequently is there's no such thing as regional excellence. <laughs> regional, either I gotta use that one. Excellent, right? Either it's excellent or it's not. <laughs> Because you're somebody in this town or somebody in this church, that don't mean nothing. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Regional. I got to use that one, bro. I'm going to steal that one, baby. I'm stealing that. I got to steal that. Regional. You got it, man. <laughs> yes, sir. I got to steal that one. So, uh, so hot. Okay. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the kinds of, of things that you practice okay. with your instrument. So, uh, during this time period, the pandemic, it has been more time to practice. <laughs> and, um, one question that I've been asking folks is what are some of the things, uh, uh, what are some of the things that, uh, you found yourself working on 
you know, just, uh, you know, I asked Leland Sklar the same question last night. And one thing that he said to me was, well, you know, he's never been a person that like practices scales and stuff like that. He says his big thing was like getting records out and just like playing the whole record, like playing with the whole record. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious, what kind of, what kind of things have you been into? I've been into simplicity. Mm. And, and a lot of people don't go back and learn or practice the major scale and the minor scale from the beginning. Because once you get the concept of the major scale and minor scale, and you can make it simple, because right now everything is about pentatonics. If you can throw all them in there, how many you can throw in there within, you know, this time, that frame and that frame. My whole thing is I sit during the pandemic, I was actually writing. And I had to sit myself down and make myself play stuff repetitiously all the time. Cause you know, once we start playing stuff, a lot of times we just let that thing kick in and we start playing something else. But to play the same thing through a whole session, it's hard to do, man, without throwing stuff in there. Can you play Mary and a little lamb for like five minutes? Da, 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 da. You can't do it. Cause you too, you too edgy. I call it educated. You too educated. It's da 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 You know, you all, you all, it ain't Mary had a little lamb no more. It's like, what is that, man? You know, the kids got to learn what that is, man. So you got to play it simple. And we don't do that anymore. We're so educated right now is that, man, we'll take a simple song and kill it. It will not be simple. And we take the hardest song and make it easy. But the, the most simplest song is the hardest song to play because you're so educated that you're going to overplay it. You can't play it simple. Mm -hmm. If somebody put a score in front of you and you're going to make some serious money, if you just play that score, you sit there and cry, man, because you know you want to put more to that score. But that's not what that, that producer is saying. I want you to play that score. Just play that score. I don't want you to add nothing. I don't want you to take nothing away. And you're sitting there going, dude, come on, man. Are you kidding me? But that's a billion-dollar thing right there, man. You, you're making serious money just sitting there going, doom, doom, ba -do, doom, doom, ba -do, doom, doom, ba -do, doom, ba -do, doom, I just get my check and go. That's when you get paid. Yeah, restraint. Son. Restraint. We can't do that anymore because it's, it's, it, we have turned the bass into a guitar and a keyboard and an organ and a horn. We have turned bass into all other instruments and took the bass away. You know, you can, I seen a, what was it, 24 string bass, 32 string bass. I'm like, man, that's not even contrary anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what you call it. A broom? I mean, what do you, what do you call it, man? I mean, the guy was like, yeah, man, you know, he's all, he can't even play like this. He's got to play like this and, and do this. And I'm like, come on, bro. And, you know, and I made a comment one time to a guy. He had, he brought a nine string bass into an RB gig. And uh, he made a comment of, yeah, check out my new bass, man. So the whole night I watched him. I was right in front of him, man. He played two strings the whole night. On an R and B gig, and I'm sitting there going, "So you got nine strings, but you only playing the two." <laughs> it upset him, man. I, and I know I did. I was like, "Bro, you 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 bought a nine string. I think you just wanted us to see it. I would have just brought it and sat it on the stand, got a four, made my money, went home. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Made my money, went home, man." You still saw my nine string back there, man. But he brought that joint, man, in the whole night. I was, I was right in front of him the whole night. He just stayed on. I'm like, hey, man, I didn't pay that money for it. He did. But it's a nice looking bass. But it's a waste, man. It's like you never did go leave the two strings.
Yeah, the, 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 that big explosion of the extended range instruments. Um, and, you know that's uh, leaving, right? You do know that's leaving. Yeah, there's a there's a few guys. Uh, there's a band. Uh, now this is not for bass. This is for guitar. What mm -hmm. I'm talking about now. But the band Animals as Leaders, and then bands like Mashuga, and some of the sort of progressive. Uh, metal bands right uh, they're kind of going that direction of course you have like charlie hunter you know but of course he's doing a whole different right a whole different kind of thing um uh and i interviewed bill dickens and this is interesting because bill is probably most responsible for bringing that whole extended range bass thing he's probably would, most responsible for that between i would say and, anthony hmm. you know anthony started out first yeah i was i would say anthony first and then bill dickens what i think bill did is made us open our ears up because anthony is a solid player he don't thump he's a fingering guy and he's like a he's like a machine that's what he is he's the most perfect Base plan machine. That's what he is. Bill Dickens to me um, opened up our minds, and and he he did it so fast that we had to come back and watch him again. Cause I, did you get the first lick? I didn't get it. But I didn't get none of that. So I got to go back and see what he did. So he opened up my mind. I won't say everybody, but. He opened up my mind when he came to that. Man, he's a beast. But the, but the difference between Bill and some of these cats that have a bunch of strings, well, not only is Bill actually playing all of those strings, but he can play a four string and he still sounds like, oh, he still sounds like that. He's a beast. Yeah. So it's not like uh, he's doing that as a, as covering up for musicianship or lack of musicianship. He's doing it <laughs> because he just wants to. Right. And I actually have on the wall back behind me, I've got I'm a, looking at that Conklin. That's right. That's a Bill Dickens signature seven. Woo! I had one of those, you know. Oh man. That's that's that a lot is, of that's a lot of range, well, bro. Well the thing is the electronics in that are ridiculous the barts that's like the best well it's got right it's got the custom bartolini's uh that he um that they designed together uh-huh <laughs> for it and then uh the electronics it's got that what is it like that five position dial that's that's boosting the the uh, the trouble and then it's got a a, a switch so a two position switch. No, I think it's three position switch for mid frequency. Then it's got bass, mid, and treble. Ah. And it's got uh, a bass boost. You pull up on the on the on the uh, on the bass EQ knob. You pull up on that, and and it's a boost. When you open up the back of it, it's got all these dip switches where you can adjust how much boost for the bass how much boost for the trouble when you boost the trouble uh-huh it's it's the most like intricate like overkill thing i've i've, I've ever seen <laughs> it's an overkill it's, yeah it's 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 incredible um but um uh, but you know you what know, i actually i, I kind of like them i like bill on on, a, on that pv cyrus man hmm I mean, the, the Bill Dickens Conklin is a cool bass. Right. It's a heavy bass. I mean, but look at the size it's, of it's you. Super heavy. Look at your look at the, the guns you got on you. And then Bill, he done lost all that weight now. So last time I saw him, man, he was uh, he was playing Cyrus, I think it was. And he might he's mm. still playing the uh the Conklin though, a white one, I think it was. Right. He's got the white one, but yeah, I have seen him with uh, it's like it's it's a similar looking bass. It still has the. It looks like it still has the same electronics. At least mm -hmm. the knobs are the same configuration. Um, 
But I'll tell you uh, the story about that bass is I wanted, I've wanted that bass for a long time. Wow. And, uh, and I've been, I've been playing with Bill since I was maybe mid twenties or something. I'm 46 now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I was playing with him, I didn't play bass. I, I, you know, I started bass in 05. You know, wow. my first instrument is saxophone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started bass in 05. And prior to that, I was playing with Bill. And I was so sort of enamored with his technique. And I was asking him questions and stuff. And I was looking at those instruments like, man. And so when I started playing bass, you know, I was just, you know, getting whatever I was getting. I had a couple Galveston basses, mm -hmm. you know, which were kind of like... Conklin knockoff bases. Right. Um, so I had a couple of those and then, uh, you know, I started getting some other instruments and, but I really, in the back of my head, it was that, man, I really want that. I really want that Conklin though. That's really what I want. And I walked into a Sam Ash huh? and there was a used one <laughs> sitting right there. And I was like, Oh snap, what do I need to sell? <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of <laughs> and I sold whatever I needed to sell and I got it man and, and uh that's that's one that I'll never sell that's a um I I'll never get rid of that one now I have mine tuned differently than he does he does his is all in fourths I have mine tuned like a guitar but then with a low b okay so it's so it's like b e a d g b e okay um, so then, uh, all of the guitar shapes for chords and stuff, I can go for, all, I can play all those, those chords. Um, and that, that kind of helped because then when I started playing guitar, I already knew the neck, I already understood the neck mm -hmm. and all the notes and everything. Um, so that, that ended up working out, but the reason I did that was because the, um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he was the double bass professor at Ohio state. He heard me practicing in my office and he was, and he, and he came, he knocked on the door. Oh, you're playing bass now. I was, I was, I was like, yeah, yeah. And he says, is that a seven string? Cause I had like a, a Galveston seven string. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, you should tune that like a guitar. Cause at that time I had it tuned where I had a low F sharp on the bottom. Right. And I was playing in church and stuff. And I liked having that real estate on the bottom so I could play without messing up the symmetry, mm -hmm. you know, cause you know, some gospel cats will detune the B string down to a and stuff like that. I didn't want to mess with that though. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So, so, <laughs> so he was like, you know what? you shouldn't even tune it like that. You should tune it like a guitar. If you did that, he says, you'd be able to play a bunch of stuff that most bass players can't play. And for the, about the first two months, I thought I had made a terrible mistake <laughs> by changing the tuning. You know, I was like, I right. can't find anything. What's going on? You know? And then, and then it started to click. And then ever since then, I kind of kept it there, but so yeah. what do you what do you tune your fours to? Same way? Oh no, the, the uh, I actually don't I actually don't own a four. What? Um, yeah, I've got a couple fives in here, but I don't I don't actually own a four. Tell me why. Um, I I owned a four at one point. I just was never grabbing for it. And most of the stuff that I play, especially like playing in church and stuff, I always needed to have that, that I always needed that lower, uh, uh, the B string. And so I was like, well, it, it's just hanging on the wall. So then I ended up selling it. I had a, like a, what was it? A PV? What is it? That T50 T4? What is that? T40? Yeah. A T40. Super heavy. Yeah. <laughs> thing um kind of like a jazz bass but maybe but a little different it has the uh 
had some different switches and stuff on it. I call it the ventriloquist because it can sound mm. like any bass you, any bass you, I, I made a video of that. The PVT-40, people don't understand. That bass can sound like any bass on the planet. You just have to learn it because every knob you turn turns you into a different um, bass. So other, if it wasn't so heavy, I would kept mine. But man, that thing is a, a treat. And it will break your 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 shoulder down, so I I, I ended up got getting rid of it. But um, the video that I made, and I call it a ventriloquist, because it, it can do anybody. It won't do it perfectly, but your ear will catch it. And like that sounds like a music man. Well, that sounds like a jazz. That's a really nice P bay. Listen to that Rick sound. How about that wall sound? You know, it kind of it was pulling all this stuff out, man. I was like, whoa, this bass is crazy, but it's heavy. I can't deal with that, man. I can't. I had to let it go, man. Let it go. But yeah, I'll take, was, I will say this about a four. I will say this about a four string. You can't cheat on a four. If you're going to, if you're going to play it, you can't cheat. I tell people all the time. I make myself take a four to church, and I know I need a five on some of the tunes. But I take a four because I have to understand that it's a bass first. It's a bass. That's what it is. It plays bass notes. So when I think I would need to hear that low B, maybe I need to position my hand somewhere else to get it. Right. On a four. And, you know, when I get, and, and I get a, a lot of people call, it's like, man, you think I should get, I'm beginning to learn, I'm beginning to learn how to play bass. You think I should get a five? I'm going to try to start playing at church. Uh, such sis told me I need to get a five because I need to get away from that organ player. I'm like, bruh, I wish the gospel cast would stop telling folks that, man. Because nowadays we have amazing sound systems. You can mm -hmm. plug a four in, man, and it and do anything you want to do, uh, any song. Um, that getting away from the organ player, man, those days are over. I mean, you got basses right now, man, who goes sub low. Four strings going sub low. You know, it's preamps just taking them so low that you can't hardly hear them. Um, so just getting a, getting a five, getting a six. I got to get a five. I got to get a six. Because I got and you can't even play a four. That's what gets me. A lot of people hit right. me up and go like, hey, man, I'm going to get a five. I was like, can you play a four? No, nah, I mean, I don't need to play no four, man. I need to start on the five. So when you have to come to a four, <laughs> you're going you gonna to be falling on the side of the road and somebody's going to need to pick you up, man, because you're going to be so so horrible. You know, turn, I, my, my whole thing is I learned on a four first, so I'm not scared of a four. I love my fives. I love my sixes. But I'm not scared of a four. I'll pick a four quick before I pick a six and a five up because it. I know I can't cheat, you know, and if, if I had to read a score, man, I, I got to have a four in my hand. I don't particularly have to have it, but I'd rather have a four and because I'm, I'm not going to sit there and, and try to figure out, oh, I went to that five, man. I just want to go there, man. Oh, dude. And, you know, frequency-wise, man, when you, you're doing musical scores and stuff, you're going to hear that, that, that when you drop down to that five, you're going to hear that, the sub difference on the, on the mix. You're going to hear it. I don't care how, you, how much you act like you ain't going to hear it. You're going to hear that sub mix. But on a four, if the song is simple, you know, and you play on a four, it takes that. You know, I mean, it's just my opinion, though. A lot of cats be like, ah. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, oh, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, you know, I talked to Victor about this. Um, I interviewed him, and mm -hmm. and he's always about playing on fours. Uh, Marcus Miller loves a four. I mean, of course that's you know that's that's what's happening um i know some gospel cats that because they still want to play on a four but they also want to be able to play some of those lower notes so they tune down just tune. they'll just tune down um and um but yeah it is it is useful with respect to staying in the same position mm -hmm. with more strings and i think that's what you're referring to as cheating um <laughs> but um yeah uh there's less less of the notes everywhere so you have to uh play a lot more up the neck on a four than you than you do on 
right. on a five or, or a six. But no. tone-wise, you know, tone-wise, you, you can really get the sonic uh, on a four. The four, to me, has the best sonic uh, mm. when it comes to wave sonics. Um, the four really talks, how can I say it? It talks pleasant. Uh, a five, to me, when, when I started doing sonic waves on a five, um, I could hear the difference. And sometimes it's shocking um, because I don't want to do that, but I want to do it, if it makes any sense. I don't want to drop down on that low, that low B, but man, that joke sounds so good. Would you drop down to that low bit? Woo! So, so, but but let me let me ask you that though. What why why is it that a four string and because I I mean because I can hear it, you know what why does a four string sound better than, um, than a five string? Because sonically is is built for that. Sonically, when a four string was built, it was built for the right wavelength and the right the right sonic link. And, and I, I try to tell people and try to explain it to them as best way as I can. Um, there's two there's two things that I question myself about. Now I'm, I'm not saying I question other folks because I know they do it. One thing is uh, when a four string is tuned in concert E, wave wise, is sonic wise. Sonic wise and way wise is correct. If you put it on mm. the meter, it's correct. It actually waves correctly. When you I start, see. when you start extending the extending bass, what they call extending bass or five string, your wave change from from this to this. Do your ear hear? No. What you hear is this, and you love that. You know, but on a four, constantly your wave is like this. On a five, your wave st- goes from here to here. Well, well, okay, so so I I I I get that the difference in the actual pitch, but what I'm mm-hmm. saying is, when I play on a four string, the E string sounds different than the E string on a five string. Yep. You know what more, I'm saying? Like more the, wood, more you have more wood, um, and a lot of times it's basically the setting, whether it's 18 millimeter, 17, 16, or 19 millimeter. It's it's that kind of setting too, um, and the stretch of it, 32, 34, 35. You know, mm-hmm. when you start getting into that kind of stuff, man, your 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 sound changes, the thickness of your note changes. Um, on a four. A regular four string jazz, it just to me it to me it has that perfect it has that perfect melody, man. Um, when I pick up my five, I can hear the difference. It's, there's a difference, but it's like you're the same bass, aren't you? Tell me you're just a five string. You know, like ah, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the same bass, but it's just different. But I have to look at the mass of the wood on the body. Okay. Yeah. You know, and the way it, the waves, how far the waves have to travel now, when when there's a four string and the, the body's like this, you know, it takes the body and it goes that way. On a five, it has to go all the way up there, come all the way back down, and then go all the way through and all the way back. That kind of stuff. So your wave, your 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 wave is changing. It sounds crazy, but it's it's definitely changing. More mass, more wave, more ways to travel and get back. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, I told you that one of the reasons why you know, I've been watching your videos, one of mm-hmm. the things that keeps me coming back is a lot of the um, modifications that you do to in- instruments. Okay. So, so anyhow, there's a, a, a kind of bass, and I did some research on it. Because it was inexpensive, and I was like, "Man, everybody's talking about it." Those SX bases. Ah. Oh. So, so here was my thought. I was like, "Wait a minute, is that a six-string, you know, jazz bass?" You know, I was like, "Oh, what what's up with that? That's strange," you know. And then I was like, "Okay," uh, I got on Reverb. Somebody was selling one, and I talked them down. Uh, I was only going to buy it 
because I was going to defret it. Right. And create a fret list. Because mm-hmm. I remember you saying that uh, you really dug the SX fretless bases, not as much the fretted ones. Yes. Woo. Yes, Lord. Those yeah. bases. Oh, the fretless. Oh, I did a track with a fretless SS, SX. I couldn't even believe my ears. I mean, it was so perfect. I mean, the, the, the wave link was perfect. The tone was perfect. The only thing that wasn't perfect to me, it was a little close. It was really close. And they're, they're kind of close. They don't match up with the real jazz. But man, the tone and their fretless basses, jazzes, remarkable. Especially taking the tape. They take the tape well. I didn't change, I didn't mod it anything. I just played it where it was, man. Just set it up, played it, and that thing took the tape, man. Woo! It's amazing. So I so I bought I bought the bass. And when I got it home, and there was all kinds of problems with it, you know, the <laughs> was, you know the, I was going to have to go. I mean, I went pretty hog wild. I, I stayed up like for like four hours. Wow. Trying to level the frets, you know, and I, I finally got it to almost. And then it's like all it took is for me to 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 touch touch the instrument with a hammer. And then it was back to buzzing all over the place again. Uh, it was like the frets were not in there. You know, they, they were they not in there it. well. Yeah, they right. were seated. So I was like, you know what? My original purpose was to defret this because I want a six string fretless. So that's what I'm going to do. So then, you know, I went and got some wood filler and I did, you know, and I watched a bunch of videos and stuff. And I'll have you know, and this is my first try. I think I got it right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got it right. So, um, but that base, you can't even see it in here, but it's, it's, it's over there somewhere, um, on the wall, but it's, a uh, great sound and bass. I think I'm going to put an Audier preamp in it. Yep. Yep. I'm going to put one of those, uh, which is, beautiful that's a great idea because you don't have to cut a hole in the body of the base for nope. a, ba- a battery com- a compartment um and yeah so that's that's what i'm gonna do and uh that idea came from you yeah i love all dear man if you ever talk to david at all dear he is like a super I genius man he works with nasa hmm. but he, he's a super genius man it's like it's like he don't say much. He just you say you, you say I say something like, "Hey, Dave, man, I'm having an issue with this. Should I do such and such?" And then he, very very lightly he'll say, "Oh, Johnny, you need to do this, do this, and do this right here." And then once that's done, you know you could go. And I'm like, "Oh, here we go, back to school, <laughs> back to school." I love this guy, man. I love Dave, man. Oh, there's a great preamp. Great preamp. Hey man, so is there anything that you'd like to um, that you would like to plug? Uh, yes. You know, one thing I want to do is I'm going to put your contact information. Okay. Uh, like the Facebook page and thing, I'll put that in the description to the video, so that folks can uh, can find you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, the only thing I want to plug, man, is is that, you know, we're hurting. And like I said, at the end of all my videos, man, pray for each other, man. Pray for your enemies. Pray for my family. Pray for, you know, the whole depot. And and yeah. just keep praying for each other, man. Because, you, know, you know, however you want to pray, that's your thing. Whoever you pray to, that's your thing. Just pray, man. Because people are hurting, man. People are hurting and people need help. And they need to laugh. Some people can't have a laugh in two years. You know, that pandemic that had them, got them in a frown, man. So, you know, pray that they may laugh again. You know, that's, that's, I don't think I could plug is that. You know, definitely just pray for me. And uh, as I pray for y'all, 
So, you know, keep the Hobo Depot open, man. We just got to keep supplying needs and desires. And that's what we do. Take something crazy and make it better. That's what I do anyway. I mean, I, I, I do want to say this. I do want to thank you because you could have went to somebody else. You didn't have to come to me, man. You know, it, and you need to know that it's more than an honor. My queen and I was talking about it today. It's more than an honor for you to even contact me and say you wanted to talk to me. You know, when people call me, man, they don't understand, man. My heart, my heart overwhelms when people call me and, and talk to me. Um, that means that they believe in something I'm doing. They believe in me. And I'm going to tell you in front of your face, man, you know, I appreciate you wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart, man, because, you, you know, I'm just a little guy. I'm just a little guy, man. I, I just... I'm just a little guy from North Carolina. <laughs> and you're Amen. talking to me. Um, you're talking to me. Hey man, you're 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 doing uh uh you're doing a good work, man. Um you're the the reason I think that your you've your channel's been growing the way that it has is because uh people I think they sense the sincerity uh in what it is that you're doing. They enjoy seeing someone love what it is that they do. And uh, I think people get a sense that you actually do care. Oh, I do. <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's not, that ain't necessarily what is going on yeah. <laughs> these days, you know? So yeah. it's a rare thing, man. Uh, and like I said, I mean, you know, I gravitated to you, to you immediately. And I, and I told you the reasons my son he just, you know, even when he was a baby, he just, he just, um, he just dug you because he just thought it was, it was, uh, something that was joyful and exuberant and, and he gravitated to it for that reason. <laughs> so I'm just saying, man, it's, uh, you're, you're doing a good, you're doing a good work. Thank you, man. Please, Thank you. Please continue. I will. I will. And I love you, man. Thank you so much. Love you too, man. You be well. I will, sir. Love you guys. All right now. Peace out. Shut it, Kaka. <laughs> Let your son hear that. Shut it, Kaka. What's your son's name? His name is Moses. Mo oh, my God. That's a great name. That's a leader name, man. That's a leader's name. Moses. Shut a cock up, bro. Shut a cock up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Later, baby. That's going to make his day. That's going to make his day. Yeah, I know. All right. Bye.